Welcome back to Your 1230, the only podcast where our guests tell their story with the help of 12 questions in just 30 minutes. I'm your host, Mike Salitro, and today we are thrilled to be joined by Augustino Pintas. Augustino is the founder and CEO of Bulletproof Cashflow, where he applies nearly two decades of real estate experience to source, negotiate, and acquire commercial properties. He's a dynamic speaker who has spoken at a wide range of events throughout the United States and Canada. His talk topics vary from business strategy to real estate to leadership development, and he is always a great resource for aspiring commercial real estate professionals. Augustino, welcome. We are really excited to be speaking with you. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Of course, of course. And I want to start there. Having had that kind of ex- wide range of experience uh, talking to audiences uh, throughout North America, do you remember what it was like taking the stage that first time? You know, I had I had butterflies in my stomach. I was practicing and practicing and practicing. I had a premeditated speech, and I practiced that thing like crazy. Now, even though at the time I'd worked in corporate for a long period of time, and I've done improv. I've tried to do like I tried Toastmasters. It just wasn't for me. But I, I did improv to kind of like break the whole, how should I say, confidence issue, right? All that it just went out the window. All I did was like I had a predefined speech and I practice, practice, practice. Now I just show up and I now I, I deliver. I know what to say now, right? But it wasn't always like that. <laughs> so it took some practice to get there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's good to hear. There's plenty of us who get nervous anytime there's any audience waiting for us. So good to know that with enough preparation and enough delivery that we're, we'll be we past that once we get there. Um, but the other part of your bio, uh, investing in commercial real estate. Um, how did you decide on commercial and what does that look like today? You know, it was one of those things that I, I've, been a, I've been an entrepreneur since I was a kid. Right. And I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to well, back then it was computers. It's all about computer stuff. And I wanted to do something in computers, like development, software side, right? But my parents, they discouraged me to do that. They said, you know what, you need a job, you need to work somewhere, it's low risk, yada yada. So I just listened to them. So I ended up going to college, two master's degrees, so all this, all these engineering degrees, all this other stuff, and going to work in corporate. Well. Corporate just wasn't for me. You can't, I feel like a square peg in a round hole. You know, you have, once you have an entrepreneurial fire burning in your heart and you go work in corporate, it's very, very hard, the older you get, especially to really try to fit in. Like, no matter what I did, like, and they, I was always loved until I disagreed with someone. And all of a sudden, like, the CEO hates me, right? So it's, it ended up being something like that. And one of the last straws was when the guy that hired me, well, I think it was 20 years ago, I started doing single families and small multifamily, started really doing that. And I had a small portfolio, I, I gather. And, um, but, you know, fast forward a bunch of years, it's about five years ago, I was working in corporate. The guy who hired me quit, new guy comes in, hates my guts, he wants to bring in his own people, right? And I was a C level executive at this company. And next thing you know, I get fired because the CEO isn't there to protect me anymore. And I got to thinking, like, how many more times can I let my future be dictated by some stranger who doesn't give a shit about me? How often can I let that happen? And many people live those about life every single day, you know, and I said, no, I'm not doing this anymore. So the one thing that we made constant, even in all those years leading up to that moment, was real estate. Real estate was, was always wasn't there for that. I just did it as like a side hustle, like a little hobby. I wasn't really serious about it. But it wasn't until I discovered the power of syndication, raising money, putting deals together, gaining the confidence of underwriting a deal, learning all these different things. I'm like, ah, that's what I need to be doing. Because there's no way you can leverage into doing big deals if you don't know how, right? That was the biggest part of it. So Fast forward to today, you know, five years later, we have three lines of business. The first line is acquisition of B and C assets. Think of workforce housing, right? So we're doing about 1,600 units here in and around Cleveland. We also have our development business. So it's, this includes ground up development and adaptive reuse of office buildings, things like that. But the third line of business, which is our fund that acquires 
single tenant net lease assets. So think Dollar General, Dollar Tree, uh, VCA, Emma Hospital, things like that. Everything's corporate backed, guaranteed leases. And the fourth line of business is a media and education business where we help people get into the real estate game, right? So with these four lines of business, we help people get into the game and all of it, all of our masterminds are delivered by me. I've transacted about $350 million worth of stuff. So I like to think I know what I'm talking about and I'm putting these deals together, right? And, um, you know, it's one of those things that that new student needs to know and it's delivered over a 50, 50 week period as opposed to like a six week boot camp or whatever, or some sort of weekend. We do this over 50 weeks, long period of time. So the person who's going through uh, one of our programs, they get a complete understanding and they're not doing the deal alone. They're doing it with the entire community. So they're if they're rest assured that the deals that they are doing are gonna be good solid deals and they won't get they won't get messed up by something in the deal that they didn't expect. You know? So yeah, it makes for a very, very good program for many people to get into into our mastering needs. Very nice. Thank you for walking us through that. I think it's it's helpful to understand kind of where you started, how it became, and especially with your kind of entrepreneurial background and facing similar instances in corporate where you did not have your your future in your hands that you were uh, at the at the whim of of who you were working with, what the company was uh, was doing, and where they were headed. Um, I, I wrote down a few notes, but I want to follow up here next. The you mentioned looking for good solid deals, and when we first um, connected, one of the things that uh, jumped out at me was the way that you assessed risk, uh, both for your investments and what you have in your portfolio, and will you help others identify as what's a good risk versus a, a risky risk. And if you could talk a little bit about that, I found it really fascinating as a way to kind of look at the market and to understand where your money's going and where you want to be at the, uh, you know, in, in the near and short, near and long-term future. That's a great question, because I would say over the past uh four years uh i'd say yeah the past four years leading up to 2020 there was a lot of speculators out there so many speculators right even in multifamily and to the point where i was even hearing on some other people's show it doesn't matter how much it costs just buy it just buy it i'm like oh my god this that's the worst advice don't do that and i'll give you an example there's there's the greater sucker theory right where there's, there's deals I hear about, and they're, they're depending, they are relying on the asset just appreciating in value just due to demand, which is extremely dangerous. Like, there's guys I know, you know, I'm, I'm in this space too, like, you know, so I'm not going to mention any names here, but they're buying deals, like, say, in South Florida, where it's $450,000 a door. For rents, where they're at the time, I think there might have been thirteen hundred bucks. So that doesn't even pencil to begin with. And they're looking to get in a deal and exit in twelve months in the hope of selling it for fifty uh, five hundred fifty thousand a door. Some, you know, so, so it's like the numbers don't make any sense. It never made sense, you know, but because the debt was so cheap, they were hoping that maybe they can unload it to someone else. The deal is a cash flow. Uh, maybe they got additional leverage or rather reduce the leverage on it, bring extra money to the table, you know, how, how they got it to satisfy the bank. Uh, maybe the DCR might have been like a one, you know, or something like that, just to get the deal done. Extremely risky. To me, it's a risky deal. I would never do a deal like that. I, I, the reason why we call our material bulletproof cash flow, not we don't call it bulletproof appreciation. <laughs> we call it bulletproof cash flow. We always look for cash flow. If there's no cash flow on day one, where it even meets the return projection on day one, we don't even do the deal. Like that's how conservative we, we are. We found plenty of deals like that, but you have to know what you're looking for. You know, uh, maybe it's uh, you know playing with the with reducing expenses. Maybe it's trying to find a find a way to, in, to increase income. But you're you're applying the various tools to get to that revenue without taking these massive massive risks and. That's the thing. I mean, I don't like doing. Well, I never. I don't do dumb deals. Like, there's dumb. There's dumb deals that are out there where you're risking, like uh, the appreciation example I just gave you. You don't see those guys in business for very long because of that. You know, I bet they didn't. I, I would bet money they did not buy a rate cap, and now the rates jumped from three percent to now seven or eight or nine percent, even depending on what kind of debt they got. Returning that deal back over to the bank is what you're doing. That's what's going on. You know. 
So yeah, it's um it's not good. You know, it's not good. It's uh it, it's so what is good is to buy an asset and buy it right. That's what it comes down to. You know, that's what we show people how to do. So I like the fact that you can just highlight right there the difference between an appreciating asset and not even the difference, but viewing one as a, an asset that solely appreciates versus one that cash flows. Uh, so one that will have money coming in ideally on day one based on what's what you're taking in for rents or, or what the tenant is paying you to be there. You mentioned having uh, commercial leases with certain commercial tenants having a, a strong uh, corporate background on those. So if you could explain just for anybody who's thinking, well, that makes sense. Of course, I want to have money coming in. How how does the, how does a tenant like that or with the corporate background how does that make it um, cash flow on day one or how does it make it pencil out before you even if we decide this is this is one of the deals I need to move on yeah absolutely so that's uh, yeah that's our, our uh, net lease fund right so what's interesting about the fund is that it's one fund okay and we might acquire 10, 12, 14, whatever number of assets in one single fund. So it's a, it's, it's a blind pool. So what we're doing is we're targeting certain asset classes, right? Or certain assets rather, uh, with a certain profile or criteria and, and return target. So that the investors know what that is. And then once we get it funded, we go out and buy the, these assets that we, that we tell the investors we're going to buy. So those types of assets, like I said, Dollar General, Dollar Tree, VCA Animal Hospital, Maybe it's the Vida, maybe it's a QSR, like a, like a Taco Bell or a Zaxby's or something along that, that line, you know? And but what we're looking for are specific cap rates related to the asset. Now, I never talk about cap rates when it comes to multifamily or when it comes to development. But when it comes to net lease, cap rates are everything. The reason why is because there's a corporate guarantee from the tenant that is in that building, it's in that space, okay? So it's one tenant, so think of that Dollar Tree, they may be driving through your neighborhood, right? There's one, usually one tenant in a big parking lot. Well, that tenant that's there has a corporate guarantee. They're gonna be there for some extended amount of time. Usually the lease has built-in rents, and if they end up vacating early, they wanna leave early, they just wanna leave, well, they're still, they still have to stick, they're still paying on the lease for the entire time, even whether it's vacant or not. They're still paying, right? That's the appeal of this type of asset. It's so good, is in fact, that when you expand it across multiple multiple assets in the same fund, yeah, you have some level of redundancy, right? So if one store does go dark for whatever reason, and you're an owner in the in the fund, you're still getting paid from all the other ones. Additionally, you get all the benefits of real estate. You get the depreciation. You get the you get some appreciation in the asset. You don't, you don't really underwrite to a high amount of appreciation appreciating in those assets. But one thing it does do, gives you monthly stable returns, monthly. Unlike multifamily, where it's quarterly and it could be choppy sometimes, depending on what's going on in the market, depending on what's going on in the tenants or whatever. Everything that we do has a corporate corporate back, either franchise backed or corporate back, one of the two, right? And that provides our investors with great, stable monthly income. So especially for times like right now, when there's a lot of uncertainty. If someone looking for great, stable monthly returns, it's perfect for them. That's why we launched that, that fund a couple of years ago. And it's been, it's been remarkable. Investors love it. They love it, you know, uh, just because that, that reason alone is enough for them to keep on investing in these deals. Yeah, with 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 the kind of ability to know or to plan with income coming in with each month on the regular cadence, that there is that elimination of of that risk. Yes, it does. It does make it a lot easier to invest, and uh, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand as you mentioned, bulletproof cash flow. Fear there's not there's not a worry there on that risk piece of it. Uh, as you describe it, though, what would you say the most difficult part? Of, of finding these deals is then because I would assume that they are fewer or far between or uh, they might be difficult to to kind of forecast what's going to look like afterward. But I'm going to let you answer the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it, it can be tough, you know, because uh, like I said, with multifamily or even development, you know, you have many, many leaders, right? And what I mean is, is that when you look at a multifamily deal, 
Maybe you look at management. Maybe their management sucks. Maybe they're out of control at their expenses. Maybe there's something you can do to improve the property, drive overall valuation, and uh, and sell it down the road for a higher price. And there's you know there's a variety of things you can do when it comes to multifamily specifically. When it comes to net lease, there's not a whole lot you can do, right? The most amount of leverage you're ever going to have is when you go just before you get on the contract. That is the most amount of leverage you're ever going to have. So you really, really, really have to understand how to put those deals together. That means understanding the, the, the details down, super, super detail on the lease itself, right? You have to really understand the lease because all the details are leased. Everybody refers to them as, oh, it's a triple net lease. No, the brokers call it triple net. The lease will tell you what it really is. What are the nets? The lease will tell you, right? You'd be surprised in the things that, that you find in a, in a, in a lease, right? <laughs> So it's pretty wild. Um, but what we've done more recently, as opposed to going to lender financing, which is what we used to do, now we're doing a lot of owner financing deals. And the owner financing deals are the ones that are making the, the deals pencil, right? Uh, because if you're not paying 8% or you're almost 9% in some cases with, her, with bank financing, and you're paying you know, 5 or 5.5 or even, or even a 6 it makes the deal way more palatable and still hit the return targets for the investors. So it's uh, it makes for a very different, very, a very different play, right? So yeah, the last uh, four deals, four net lease deals we've done were all, were all like owner finance types of areas. And so I have a feeling that we're gonna see a lot more of that, which usually happens in this type of environment, you know, economic environment. Um, usually what happens is owner financing or some sort of alternative financing source usually comes through it because the money is just too expensive now, getting from the banks and from the lenders. Now, I'm glad you brought up the owner financing piece because we'll hear in the real estate market that interest rates are high, the market is tough, I don't know what to do, and I kind of just give up. But if you talk to people who are active, who know what they're doing, who are still doing well in a dipping market, it's because they have creative solutions, a different approach, or a combination of those things. And uh, that's not all that all that uh, extreme or all that uncommon, but it is a different way of looking at an A-B transaction where I've got a seller, buyer, buyer's going to... Uh, secure their financing. What does that conversation with the owner look like when you're discussing owner financing to kind of uh, put that in motion? So the way I paint the picture is you have to prioritize their needs first. That's with everything. Even when you're raising money, it's the same thing. No one cares about you. That's why it's so in, in, our, in our coaching <laughs> program, I just say, listen, listen, Joe, no one cares about you. It's all about me. I want to hear how you're going to help me. So tell me about how you help me. Yeah, so so you're, you're secondary. I'm the first guy. You know. So you have to make it about them. So how do you do that? Well, if if they're new or they've been unsophisticated to or not in the know of how this stuff works, they'll immediately be, be suspicious, right? And a suspicious mind or a confused mind always says no. They're, that's the default setting. So you kind of have to educate them about what it, what it is and how does it work and why is it better. But if they already understand what it is, then they're already gonna know that the tax benefits are remarkable for them. Right? They don't take the giant tax hit at the beginning, right? Secondarily, they have control of the deal. So even if down the road, for whatever reason, we stop paying, I don't know, something happens, we default and whatever, something bad happens, they get control of the property. So they got a they got a big chunk of money up front. They got all the payments along the way, and they get to keep the property too. It may not be a bad deal. There's not a bad deal for them now, is it? Right? So there, there's a whole there's a whole litany of reasons why, but you have to make it about them first. And it's a very it's, it's tough making a blanket, I said a, a blanket response. But one thing I do always ask is what's important to the realtor? Or I'm sorry, I was a broker. What's important to the seller? What's important to the seller? And if they say the word of tax implications, then, then I hone in on that and I, I prepare, I sit down and prepare all of the benefits related to taxes. Sometimes it is, they just want to cash out and take that money and roll into a new deal. You know, if there's a way for me to figure out how to structure such a thing, I will, but it depends on what it is, right? But I think first and foremost, finding out what the seller wants. And then tailoring the response directly to that is huge. But 
you know, long story short, the benefits of doing a really fun this deal to the industry is you even see you as the person creating the transaction. Obviously, there's an interest rate, but here's the thing. Let's say you own you own this um, you own a warehouse. Right? Well, this is this is a real life example, actually. You you've owned a warehouse for about 20 years. Okay, so you know your tax bill from 20 years ago is super low, right? But I do a land contract with you. Not so it's not it's not actually in a land contract, the land contract does not transfer. Like you still you still hold the deed, you hold on to the deed. I have control of the property, but you have the deed. Okay. So what does that mean for me? So I have a I have a five-year term on this thing, right? So that means over the next five years, I'm paying the same tax rate as you pay back here. I put a tenant in here. And this is cash flow. The entire time, so at least I get to I get to make up a bunch of cash in the meantime. So I so I, I, I have to refi. But once I refi at that point, great. So now I I you know I get to sock away a bunch of money, make some extra cash in, in, in that deal, and then pull out a refi and then bring the taxes to go up there. I can probably try to fight it or do whatever. But you get my point. You get five in that case. You get you know, extra time to cash flow and put sock away as much of cash to, to to pay down the taxes later. That's that's a helpful example. And I want to highlight the kind of the middle part there, the, the two things you identify that in real estate or really anything when trying to make a deal or trying to work something out with another party, one, understand what's important to them, why they're involved in this deal, why they um, you know, might be interested in the first place of selling, buying, whatever they're doing. And then two, as you said, make it about them, make it kind of fit that here's why you're doing this here's why it's best for you or here's why it makes sense because the, the confused mind always says no that's a it's a great starting point that if i don't do a good enough job explaining how this works then forget it not, not only we're we not going to do anything creative they're not going to want to do anything with me so understanding what their position is and how a certain scenario how a certain framework can benefit them great advice in this in this example and, and in many so thank you for sharing that uh, a couple other things that i wrote down um you mentioned having uh, the ability to flip through a lease, understand what's in it. And then we've also talked about understanding the tax implication, being able to pencil out a deal, figure out a cap rate. Uh, so that's a lot of different skills from numbers to being able to understand contracts, land contract you reference. Uh, how how are you able to kind of, usually I'm a numbers guy. Uh, no, I, I'm a, I can do contracts. Are you, are you doing both of those? What does your team look like? How oh, do you, yeah. go, go ahead. <laughs> I'm not that guy. Uh, no, so I have um, I have a really good. So first, I have great partners, and uh, so my wife, for instance, is very good about going into the details. Like she studies that thing. So we have her and another partner that's also very detail oriented. Our process is that each one of them goes through the lease, and they start picking to it first. So independently, and then they come together and they compare notes, right? And then only after that do we decide if we want to do the deal. If we do want to do the deal just based on that, we look for any gotchas, then we send it over to the attorney, and then they start looking through. So they go us by the hour, right? So the attorney, so we have a, I have a whole army of attorneys that all these attorneys do different things. And this attorney, all they do is net lease. That's it. They just all they do is net lease and do nothing else. So they understand what a family dollar lease looks like. They've seen just about all of them. And believe it or not, there's all different kinds. There's one we had from, I think it was from, 19, from 1955. It's all typed out on a typewriter, right? Uh, so it's like, you know, remember those old ditto papers? You know, you ever see that? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, so it was like the, yeah. the light blue, yeah. Uh, and it was like that. That's what it looked like. You know, it was crazy. So, and it's still in the lease, you know? So it's, uh, those are the types of leases that they, these guys have seen them all. I mean, you want to have the, you want to have someone like that on your team that's experienced and saw just about every type of scenario, understand the various elements that's in there. So aside from that, we've also built some proprietary technology that helps us not only select and find deals, right? We also have some technology that helps us send them deals too. So all that stuff is custom just to us. We built the entire thing. My background, as I said, is IT, so we're pretty good with tech. You know, you know, right? So uh, when it comes to that, we also use a bunch of other different tools to help us identify at least guessing in how much revenue that location is generating. Because sometimes many of these, these locations do not want to share that information. And they don't technically have to, so they don't. 
Uh, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. We usually don't. So we use other tools to try to figure that out because if we can demonstrate that the property, the dollar store, for instance, is, is losing customers, right? Maybe they're getting nothing in the traffic, maybe the per ticket sold is going down, to figure that out, then chances are you may not want to buy that deal, right? So, uh, because ultimately we're trying to limit the downside by understanding how long they're going to stick around for and if they're going to be moving. Right. So it, there's a lot to it. I mean, fortunately, we have a great team that really understands how to put these two deals together. You know, so that's one of my core practices. Yeah, I absolutely love that answer because you hit all the big parts, the, having expertise in certain areas, having a process built out from doing this multiple times and being able to uh, cut out inefficiencies, and then having that, as you mentioned, the independent review where you've got a couple people looking at similar things and they are going to then compare notes to make sure that they are not missing anything, that they are uh, evaluating the terms the same way. And then having those, from your tech background, the built-in redundancies where you, someone's going to catch something maybe that somebody didn't. So um, I really like the way that you spell that out. And again, that's applicable not just to real estate investing, many different fields. Uh, as we look up here, we are almost nearly at time somehow. So I uh, will try to get out of here with a couple more questions. Up. But I want to ask, someone's listening to this, like, I, I, Augustino, that this makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, I haven't been involved in real estate investing before. I want to do this, but I, I don't know if I don't know if it's right for me. I don't I don't know if I have the money. Where can I? How can I start? What can I do tomorrow to to get me get me involved in a real estate deal that uh, it cash flows? Yes, that's a great question. I mean, look, there's always so many books you can read. Uh, there's always so many podcasts you can listen to. There's, there's always so much, so many meetups you can attend, but nothing happens until you take action. It's something that our brain does to protect us from, from making mistakes, right? It's, it's um, you know, you're dealing with, uh, you're dealing with a brain that wants to keep us safe. And it'll trick you into thinking you're doing stuff because you show up to a meeting, you show up to a meetup, you're reading a book, look at me, I'm, I'm into real estate now, yay! No, it's not, it's your brain, it's a brain fooling you, right? And when you think that putting up money into a mentorship is a lot, ah, that's when it's time to invest. Because it's your brain telling you, oh my God, there's a risk. We're losing the resource. We're losing, we're losing some money here. No, you're investing in the future. It's what you're doing. And you're investing in the future with other like-minded individuals just like you to prevent you from making these very mistakes that your brain is trying to keep you from making. <laughs> right? So... Because if you're trying to do it yourself, you certainly can, but you're at greater risk of making a mistake, right? But if you align yourself with experts that have done this before, and like I'm, like I said, I'm the guy that runs it. I'm, I'm, I'm actively in these masterminds personally, right? I won't let people make dumb mistakes. I just want to let them do it. Okay? So being around other people that have done it and being part of a mastermind will, will share you so much more time of your, of your, your life, it's just going to be tremendous if you do it by it. You just want to do it yourself. You're just adding more time. And I can tell you right now, I mean, listen, you know, we're printing off dollars and sending them to Ukraine and to Israel and to wherever, right? Someone's got to pay for that. It all shows up in, in, in the, with taxes and with inflation. We're paying for it right now. So we're, we're, we're all doing, we're all seeing inflation, right? But that's because we're printing money into oblivion. Right. Meanwhile, real estate is increasing in value. So you want to own real estate is what you want to do. So you have to get into real estate. Now it's now is the most important time to get into real estate at this point. So I strongly advise anyone that is thinking about it to get into the real estate field. You have to. You, know, you just have to. Okay. And where can our listeners uh, connect with you? Where can they find out more if they want to take that next step? Sure, sure. So, uh, both of is a great place to start. If you're interested in some sort of coaching, uh, go to the multifamilyadvantage.com. That's it's a great, uh, great video there to tell you how this stuff works. Or if you're looking at, say, raising capital, you want to learn how to raise capital, guide to capital.com, free ebook. Go ahead and check it out. You'll see, you'll get an understanding uh, as to just how that part is handled. But I'll tell you, uh, we certainly go through all that stuff in our program. And if you want to master these various ways of raising money or signing confidence or building out your, your marketing profile, all these different types of things, yeah, I think it's time to consider a mentorship. 
Excellent. Excellent. So we will post those links. Augustino, thank you very much for joining us. This has been a blast. Uh, and I look forward to doing it again. Thank you so much.